anti-Semitism is on the rise in a way not seen in years on campus, on social media, in the streets. We're seeing massive protests with signs that are clearly anti-Semitic. They have swastikas, they have slogans calling for the killing of Jews. We're hearing self-styled woke progressive activists chiming in in the same direction. This is another episode in our special series of podcasts illuminating aspects of the Hamas-Israel war. I'm Ilan Jerno. Joining me today is Ankar Gatte. We're going to unpack anti-Semitism. We're going to talk about how an objectivist perspective on this issue, this persistent evil, helps explain its actual nature. So Ankar, I thought we should start with just identifying what is anti-Semitism and how do people understand it? So if you look in a dictionary, naturally, the, the thing that you will find is that it's hostility or prejudice against Jewish people. So I think the easy observation here is that it's about a collective, it's about a group. But here, this is where I think the common or conventional understandings really break down, because one thing you'll hear is it's about essentially about religion. And I don't think that's really true in the contemporary space, in the, as we're seeing it today in the streets and on social media, uh, partly because often the people identified as Jews, there's no evidence that they're actually believers. There's no evidence that they practice this religion. And in many cases, it's, it's certainly not true. So they're not being isolated because of their religious belief primarily. It's they're being isolated and, and persecuted because of a membership in a group. Uh, and I think the other dimension that people think of is it's, a, it's akin to racism or is a form of racism. And I think there's, this is in the right direction. There's certainly aspects of this that look like racism. But again, the the... A moment's reflection will tell you, first, race is not a useful category to think about. And second, insofar as people identify by a certain race, there isn't a clear Jewish race. If you, if you visit Israel, if you visit a Jewish community, you'll see that there are people from all parts of the world who look very different insofar as race corresponds in some sense to physical appearance. It doesn't really match. Uh, so I think this is there's something here about being grouped into a collective and being seen in some way that is not about the kind of choices you make that's true in the conventional system. But I don't think this is really adequate for understanding the, the contemporary surge in anti-Semitism. I'm curious, what's your experience in seeing this and how do you think of it? Yeah, I agree, especially with the, it's not essentially today about religion. It's not that, that there are, taking issue with some of the religious doctrine of Judaism. It's directed at a group of people. Um, it's indiscriminate of treating all these people the same. But yeah, they can identify it exactly as a race, but there's something in common that they think of and that they're viewing these people. And it's very dehumanizing. This is part of what people, the, the, that it's akin to racism. It's a dehumanization of viewing everyone not as individuals but as the member of some collective you can have a collective assessment of these people as bad evil um, and they need to be eliminated or eradicated the and i think if one asks so what is it that they're actually viewing the whatever jews or israel what they have in common it's much more now what anti-semitism is is it's a mask for viewing um, or of a hatred of ability, achievement, success, prosperity. I think one saw that just with Israel uh, the, as a focal point. When Israel became a powerful com uh, country, many people have noticed that after the 1967 war, when they routed the Arab armies that are trying trying once again to eliminate Israel, it became clear, yeah, Israel is a successful, powerful country that's achieved something. And world opinion flipped from viewing Israel as, okay, maybe we should be sympathetic. They're victims of the Holocaust. Um, they need a refuge to now they're powerful. They've achieved something. They're far outstripping economically the countries in the, the other countries in the Middle East. And that engendered not respect, admiration, and people wanting to emulate their achievement, but resentment and 
envy and that that's part to understand anti-Semitism today. I think that root of it has to be understood and exposed. When you talk about envy and the hatred of and resentment of achievement, this calls to mind the identification that Ayn Rand makes, which is she calls it envy, but she says this is not the best term for it. It's the most, it's the closest term for something much worse and more evil. Uh, envy is typically understood as a, 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 similar to jealousy, is you want something from others or you want what they have. But what she's identifying is you don't want them to have it. You don't want anyone to achieve a value. It's not that you're looking at something and, and thinking, oh, I should emulate that. I should go and achieve it. It's the leveling down. And that this kind of mindset is it's pervasive in today's society. She wrote an essay called The Age of Envy, where she analyzes different manifestations of it. I think this is part of what a, the objectivist perspective brings that's so illuminating, because this mentality, this envy driven, this hatred of the good mentality, it's it has roots both in moral theory and in the way people think. And on the one side, as you were saying, that the world opinion shifted after Israel proved itself to be capable in the 1967 war. It was no longer this weak, victimized society. It was able to defend itself. There, I think the, the op one operative idea was that you have to side with those who are weak. This is the altruistic perspective, that those who haven't accomplished something, those who haven't achieved, those are the ones who deserve your pity, not because they're right, but because they're weak. And that was definitely true. And then that's, I think, a, a fundamental reason for that flip that you're describing. And I think it's also it also speaks to the kind of resentment that you see of, of Israel today elsewhere. And I think the other route here, which I'm interested in hearing more from you on, is that it's a kind of mindset that goes along with that, which is the way you think about the world. And I think Ayn Rand sometimes talks about it as being anti-effort and this resentment of having to do the work to think about the world and navigate it. How do you con conceptualize that? Yes, yes, she put it, it it's anti-effort, it's anti-intellectual, and her, I think, preferred term is it's anti-conceptual, that to live a human life, to live a life where you make something of yourself, that you're oriented towards values, achievement, knowledge, prosperity, it takes a lot of effort. It takes, and primarily it takes mental effort. And then you translate your ideas and your vision and your ideals into action in the world. Um, in the way that Israel built a country out of nothing coming out of World War II. That, that's the kind, it takes first mental effort and then it takes a lot of physical effort to build and to create. And when someone's faced with that, you have you can think of it as two options. You can think, yeah, there's something here that's admirable and that I want to emulate, which means I'm going to put in the work, I'm going to put in the effort, I'm going to put in the thinking to try to match and maybe even outpace this achievement. So one could have seen in the Middle East with the rise of Israel, other countries and the people in those countries saying, Oh, this is a great achievement. This is way better than what we have. How do we match this? How do we equal that? But that takes effort, thinking, and action. And a person who's oriented towards, no, I don't want to put in effort. I don't want to um, have to do the work to achieve, to create. When he's faced with achievement and creation, it's not, oh, I want to emulate that. It's, I want to erase it because it's like an affront to me, pointing out my flaws, my inadequacies, the fact that I won't do anything and I won't put in the effort to rise. It's a reproach. And that's what generates, okay, so I want to smash this. And if I eliminate this, then the reality won't be pointing out that, look, you haven't put in any effort, you haven't done anything. And of course you're stagnating because everybody will be stagnating. And so there'll be no contrast. And that's part of what, the, and this is, I think her view in the end was, this is what a tribal mentality is and a descent into tribalism. She started seeing that towards the end of her life and wrote articles about this, one of them, global balkanization of, of it as a kind of worldwide growing phenomenon. 
And I think it's this mentality that it's what you want to do is smash the other. And it's generated by a, a mentality that is unwilling to put in the effort to build and to rise. I think it's important to identify how we think of Israel and of, of Jewish culture and so forth, just to put our view in contrast to many others. And I think the important thing, and this is something I talk about in my book, What Justice Demands America in the Israeli-Palestinian Conflict, Israel is a kind of package of conflicting elements. And the two that people see is that Israel sees itself as a Jewish and democratic country. I don't think that's an accurate characterization. I think it's a Jewish slash tribal country, and it has significant elements of enlightenment values. And that you can see in it in manifested in its significant protection of individual rights, of economic, political freedom, of freedom of thought. And those, I think, are the engines or the drivers of its success. And I think it's precisely to the extent Israel has liberated its people to act and to think and to produce and to trade, that I think is the ev the driver for its prosperity and its growth. And, and that's carried through to all individuals in that society. So it, in that sense, Israel has conflicting roots in, in it, both uh, its Jewish identity, its tribal identity, which is very much uh, fostered and reinforced within Israeli culture. And I think it's important to differentiate that so the fact that Israel has those two elements, and then to understand that while the people around Israel in the Middle East hate it, partly because it's Jewish, I think the, the contemporary hatred of it is rooted at what you're describing, which is the fact that it's accomplished so much. And it's, it's the enlightenment aspects of it that have driven that. And that's the root of its success. And that's what is an affront to those who hate it. It is not primarily the fact that it is Jewish. I think it is a factor and it's certainly part of the hatred. There's no question of that. And one has to recognize that. And then the other thing I think that's important in differentiating our view is when we think about, you were talking about the kinds of traits and behaviors that are associated with Jews in the culture generally. And I think it's important because of the way people now have a warped view of what culture is. It's often, and I think Jewish culture is particularly difficult to disentangle. It's often seen as something innate. You're born into a culture, a culture is not something you choose, and it's often bound up with race and, and uh, collective identity. But I don't think that's the proper way to think of a culture. I think a culture is a set of practices and beliefs and things that people create. It's man-made, and it can be good or bad or mixed. And I think this is the aspect in which the elements of Jewish culture, and so far as you you single it out and people are opposed to it, it's the chosen values that are the root of its success. So the valuing of thinking and education and learning, uh, the production, the trade, the pursuit of profit, those things which are, and I think they're rightly associated with Jews, but not exclusively, but they're, they're very frequently associated with Jewish people and Jewish culture. Those are good things, and they're good things for everyone to, to embrace. They're good things irrespective of what family you're born into, what race you think you are, what culture you, you regard as your own. Those are universal values. And again, again, I think those are things that you can see in other societies and their, their roots of what makes America a good society. So it's important to differentiate the chosen values inherent in a, in a group of people's culture and then within a society, so Israel's cult, political framework and its uh, um, the kind of values that that government system upholds. And I think it, when you understand that the best elements of Israel are rooted in the best ideas of the West, of the Enlightenment legacy, then the kind of hostility you see towards Israel is not explained by Israeli politics primarily. It's not, there's no Israeli pol policy that could be adopted that would assuage the hatred or that would appease the hatred of those who see it as an affront to their lack of achievement, to their lack of willingness to, to uh, pursue values. So I think in that sense, it's a deep kind of hatred and it's a hatred of good things for being good things that have been embraced by a certain group of people and that could be embraced by others. Yeah, let me give three 
points to reinforce what you're saying and, and some of the evidence for what you're saying. So that it's not essentially about Judaism as a religion. The Arab world, when it first started attacking Israel, and that's from the inception of Israel, was viewed and viewed itself as at least at least its leadership as more secular, were socialist, communist, and still they wanted to eradicate Israel off the face of the map. And it wasn't that, oh, it's because we're Islamic and this is Judaism in the presence of Islam. They grafted on to Islam as a means to try to destroy Israel. It's the, the weapon of socialism, communism doesn't seem effective. So let's find something else. But what stayed common is they wanted to wipe out Israel. And that tells you the hatred's deeper and not primarily about the religion. And then from the other side, that as Israel became more distinctively Western, so it started as embracing socialism and like maybe that's the wave of the future. And it's become in the last few decades, much more capitalistic, entrepreneurial, a whole mentality that you're to be ambitious, to rise, to create. I mean, it, I mean, there's a book called now the Startup Nation about Israel and all the kind of entrepreneurial activity that's going on. As Israel, be, Israel became more like America, it became more hated. And that too is telling you that yeah, the hatred is not directed towards the, the, the fact that it's a Jewish religion or the fact of the kind of concrete grievances that they'll bring up. It's that Israel is successful and the more successful it became and the more reproach to a stagnant kind of mentality, the more hated it became. And then to get, and especially on college campuses, that what is driving it is a real hatred of values. I think the juxtaposition of the Israel Hamas war with Russia Ukraine is important to get the motivation of what is going on. Ukraine did basically nothing. Russia's a dictatorial thuggish place that attacked it. Where are the students? Where are they protesting? Where are they asking for a ceasefire? Where are they asking to drive Russia out of here? Why don't they care about it? They don't care about it because it's Ukraine being attacked. It's something that's compared to Russia, more Western, um, more prosperous. They don't care about that. But Israel against Hamas, they care that Hamas, that they whitewash Hamas and what their nature is. And they care that, oh, well, Israel doesn't have a right to do this. And this is all disproportionate. We need a ceasefire for this. So when I mean, Hamas is vicious totalitarian killers, which they demonstrated on October 7th. But anybody who has knew anything about the region knew that this is the nature of Hamas. That they don't want to eliminate. And what they their whole animus is against Israel. And when you have something parallel that you have a victim in Ukraine, they don't care about that victim because it's not primitive, um, stagnant, uh, 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 anti-conceptual or tribal in that way. And that they're not calling for a ceasefire there, but they want Israel to stop after it's being attacked. That tells you they're not driven by anything resembling values. Why don't we talk a bit about the drivers of what makes anti-Semitism in today's world such an enduring phenomenon. And we've already touched on a couple, a couple of these, but let's develop a bit more when you were saying how the neighboring Arab countries in the Middle East over the last few decades, 50 years plus, 75 years, have turned against Israel and become more and more hostile to it, I think a major part of that story that we've talked about uh, at length here at the Institute is the rise of Islamic totalitarianism as an ideological political enterprise in the region. And the big turning point for that was the 1979 Iranian Revolution, which really supercharged and, and, and galvanized rather uh, the Islamist movement, including groups like Hamas, which was inspired and, and came to fruition in the 1980s. Now, I think one way people understand Islamic totalitarianism 
is th this is a, a goal of establishing a, a society defined in every respect down to every last detail by Islamic law. And, it, and that can seem at a certain level like, well, they have a certain vision. Those are their ideals and they're trying to realize them. And the reality is that those aren't ideals. Those are vicious goals. And they're, um, they're really about dominating people, about destroying people. And the, the further deeper analysis of what Islamic totalitarianism provides is the point you were uh, point, uh, um, you mentioned earlier, which is it, it is a powerful rationalization for the failure of Islamic Arab countries in the region by comparison with Israel. And I think this is the important thing. It, it is not an accident that the Islamist movement has an obsession with Israel. And it's not because they feel threatened by it. It's because they threaten materially, like Israel's going to attack them. Isn't there's, there's no interest in going after them. What they're threatened by is the, the evidence of its success as a basically Western society, as a basically secular, non-Muslim, infidel society that is just unimaginably more prosperous uh, and, and more advanced intellectually and politically and scientifically. And that is a, a rebuke or a reproach, as you put it earlier, to the story that they tell themselves and they tell their followers, which is we're, we failed because we haven't been pious enough. We need to be more pious. We need to be more uh, loyal to the path of Allah. And we have to kill people who stand in our way. And that I think is a, a, an example of how evil ideologies are systems of rationalization. This is the identification Ayn Rand makes. I hope I got the wording right, but it's basically that if you have one of these uh, ideological systems that is fundamentally mystical, fundamentally irrational, it is a powerful tool for rationalizing evil and, and carrying out evil and, and covering up the goals that you have that you aren't willing to truly speak of. And I think that's an important driver in understanding the anti-Semitism of the Islamic totalitarianism movement and in the, the region generally. And one just quick side point for people, I, I hope people will go and read the Hamas covenant, which is its founding document. It is a horrible document, but it, it's, it, it's frank about what they're trying to do. The aspect that I think I would point people to is to see its connection and its citing of a notorious anti-Semitic conspiracy fantasy theory, how you characterize it, called the Protocols of the Elders of Zion. How anyone could take that seriously is, 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 is hard to comprehend, but it is mentioned in the Hamas covenant as a reputable source for what the, quote, Jews are trying to do, which is to take over the world. So this is, it's woven into their mentality. It's something they are proud to include in their founding document. I think that speaks to the kind of rationalization of, of the hatred of the good, where this is what they'll resort to. Um, I want to put it, uh, throw it back to you, Ankar, to talk about some of the other drivers that we see uh, in, in other parts of the world that are behind anti-Semitism today. We have a growing tribalism. And if the analysis of tribalism as it's a primitive anti-effort, anti-intellectual mentality, if that's right, then if it's rising worldwide, it's going to break up people into warring tribes. That's and, and we mentioned before Ayn Rand's article, Global Balkanization. That's what she started to see, that the globe is more resembling becoming more and more resembling the balkans which you can think of as uh, it's a it's a primitive backwater of europe it was often viewed like that of these warring tribes that your and part of your whole identity becomes defined by the other and opposition to the other the outsider and you can see that you certainly see that on the political right today the the rise of of nationalism which people have noticed across the globe europe america um in the far east as well the and the kind of populism if we think just here in the us the trump phenomenon and when they trump talk about trump's base and that his base is unshakable part of what that means is no matter what he does people are going to keep following him that's a tribal leader 
it's my leader, right or wrong, my tribe, right or wrong. The more that, that that's how people see themselves and see the world, it's akin to racism in that it's the, there's the inside group and we're good no matter what we do. And there's the outside group, they're bad no matter what they do. And the to really uphold that kind of view, you become more and more unconcerned with what's true, what you can actually defend and validate. And you it's just about attacking other people. So the, the, there's a real descent into tribalism. We had a podcast, uh, what is it, about a week ago or maybe less than that, on Ayan Hirsi Ali when she announced that why not, she's now a Christian. And when you read that document, as we talked about in the podcast, it's just, it's a tribal document. It's, I'm fearful of the Islamist, of Russia, China, the woke, and I need a tribe that's going to attack these people and somehow that I'll feel at home in, and that's all I'm gonna do. And it, but, but it really comes across as, yeah, we're in, it's a warfare. There's nothing you can do about it. So you have to join some tribe. And for me, the Christians were the most innocuous. Um, so that's why I'm joined. I want to draw out one other uh, manifestation of anti-Semitism that people have noticed and is worth unpacking a bit. And that is the kind of uh, anti-Semitism on campus that has really come to the fore in the last month or so since October 7th. And here, I think it, people's reactions are understandable, but I, I think it, it betrays a misunderstanding of what's going on on campus. So people have been shocked that there are um, DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion administration. So many, many administrators who are there to help students uh, uh, of different minority groups. And, and they're just, it's a real burgeoning part of what universities are about, both in hiring and in, in the, the promotion. And in every dimension you can think about, this is what now permeating how universities think of the students, think of their faculty, think of their mission. And what people noticed, and I think it's it's really striking and revealing, is that since October 7th, there have been a lot of anti-Semitic attacks and threats on college campuses. I mentioned earlier, I think it's Cornell, the students were so afraid of credible threats that they would be harmed that they had to hole up in their dorms, they didn't leave. Uh, uh, there's a real outcry over this. And you see it with students marching on campus, sh shouting slogans that are unequivocally about eliminating Jews. So the river to the sea slogan, I don't I don't care what people try to say to sanitize it or to, or to pretend it means something other than let's kill all the Jews in Israel. It, that's what it means. And it's you might as well be talking, ch chanting Nazi slogans, or you might as well be chanting what the crowd in Charlottesville in 2017 was chanting, which is the Jews will not replace us, which is based in the conspiracy fantasy about Jewish uh, taking over, Jews taking over the world. That's what's going on in college campuses. And people are saying, where are all the DEI administrators? Why aren't they coming in? Why aren't they helping the Jewish students who feel actually intimidated, actually facing aggression, not microaggressions, whatever that means in, in the, the framework of the DEI, but actual aggression and physical threats. And I think this is puzzling to people. So Ankar, do you, do you think this is a, a, a bug in DEI or is it a feature? How do you think of this? I think it's a feature of DEI. I think of DEI and the, its dominance on at the university level and it, there's administ, in the administration and there's DEI officers and so on. It's an offshoot of an academic doctrine of egalitarianism. And egalitarianism is a uh, abstract formulation to justify hatred of the good for being the good. This was Ayn Rand's view of it. She wrote about it. You can read her analysis in, in one of the articles. It's an untitled letter because it, it started to rise with Raw, John Rawls in the 1970s and it took over academia. It, it started in the philosophy departments, but it went way beyond the philosophy departments. And something like DEI is just now the concrete execution of the egalitarian vision. And the egalitarian vision, what it means is the hatred of the good for being the good. It was directly an attack on 
any individual of intelligence or ability. It's you don't deserve your intelligence. You don't deserve your ability. Anything that flows out of that, you did not earn. You don't have a right to. It can and should be taken away from you and will let you function only to the extent that you serve the people who are not intelligent, who don't have ability, who haven't earned anything. Putting it back to what we were talking about, to the anti-conceptual mentality, the people have not, who have not put in any effort, any thinking, they're at the top. And the individual who has intelligence, ability, and who has exercised it, he's at the bottom, he doesn't count, he needs to be uh, eliminated unless he's serving the people who don't achieve anything. That's what egalitarianism was about. And de diversity what and equity and inclusion. Equity is just a synonym for the egalitarian vision. What they mean by equity is the egalitarian vision. And that's a vision that is about tearing down the people who earn something, who achieve something, who build. And so that when it happens to the Jews on campus, if they're seen as, yeah, but they're the representation of people who think, who actually exert ability. The Jews are now associated with, um, they have a lot of money, they make build enterprises and companies, there are massive donors to the university and so on. You don't count if that's what you do on, in the egalitarian vision. And indeed, you need to be torn down. And so that they turn they, that people are experiencing it like, aren't they turning a blind eye to it? No, they're not turning a blind eye. They know full well what it is. And their their attitude is, yeah, this is what has to be destroyed. So we should wrap up. I think there are a couple of other points that are important to reinforce and, and, and establish more fully. And that is, I, the thread that's come out in this discussion is that the to understand anti-Semitism, it's, it's really important to understand the mentality, the mindset behind today's rise of tribalism. And it manifests different ways for the Islamists, for the right-wing populists slash nationalists on the American right, so-called, and, and this sort of woke phenomenon where it focuses on identity and then sorting people by uh, those group features and unchosen features that they have. And I think it, it, let's circle back to the point I raised earlier, which is that a conventional view of anti-Semitism is that it's basically about religion. And here, I think the point you made in another conversation uh, we had was that it, it is religion still uh, connected to today's phenomenon, but religion understood in a particular way. So what's happening is that religion itself is a kind of unrecognized tribal phenomenon. Is, is that accurate? Yeah, I think of when, when you look at a culture wide, a religion is a tribal phenomenon. It's just a tribal phenomenon that people have accepted and now often think is innocuous, but it's not innocuous. And when you think of the centuries of anti-Semitism, I mean, for sure, a significant part is connected to, for instance, Christians versus Jews. And when you think of at the level of sort of the, uh, the person on the street of, like, I identify as Christian and I, I, as a result, I hate the Jews, that they, that person ha does not have a thought out view. This is the evidence for Christianity. I've thought about it a lot. I think Christianity is true. And I've looked at Judaism. It doesn't make sense to me. And the evidence they point to is wrong. And so it's not a thought out conceptual perspective on either themselves or other people. It's much more, I've been told that this is the proper doctrines and what I'm supposed to believe and what I'm supposed to do. And so this is what my tribe does. These are our practices that are incantations, our dogmas. And they, other people, have something very different. And then if you can paint them as, I mean, one of the things was Jews or Christ killers, that like, they're not just other and alien, in it, but they're a threat to you. So, um, And you don't understand why. And you might, like, even at an individual level, you, you trade with them and so on. But it's now it's from a tribal perspective. Yeah, but they're evil and they need to be smashed. That, it, like, 
there's centuries of that. And that's part of what religion inculcates. It inculcates a tribal mindset. And, and so that it's tribalism today, that's in common, I think, with what it was in the past. It was more under the veneer of uh, religious tribalism, but it's still a tribal mentality in the end, I think. Let's make this the last observations. And I think the natural question people will have is, what do you do about this? What's the antidote? What's the solution? And I'm very sympathetic to that. I think it, this is a, a, a profound evil that is scourging our society. It's, it's, it's all over the world, as we've talked about today. The caution I would give people is that if, if this analysis rings true, if it, it actually is, as we're arguing, rooted in a kind of mentality, there is no quick fix. And I think it's a mistake to expect one. It's a mistake to, to hope for one, precisely because if, if people are educated in schools and universities and inculcated with this mentality that you, you described it as this egalitarian perspective, that the, those who have achieve, uh, ability don't deserve to have it. And you, are, you exist only so far as you serve those who don't if that's the orientation you get it's permeating your education those are the ideas you're explicitly taught in higher education and it becomes the kind of mindset that you're marinating in that is a very deep problem and it requires much more than just educating people about say the evils of nazism or the evils of the whole all of which are important and it's important for people to understand what happened in the past and to learn those lessons but it's also important to understand that that isn't sufficient, not even close to sufficient to uproot this evil that is going through our society, that's poisoning our, our world. I think the important sort of at a culture level is, is if you understand that this hatred of the good for being the good is, it's a war against all values. It's, it's a war against achievement and the possibility of achievement and the, the, the faculty that each individual has that makes them possible, makes it possible for them to achieve anything, to learn something, to create. That's what this is a war against. It's a, it's a war against the best within people and their free values that people might create. That is, the, that is the evil here. And I think what you need is a reorientation towards actually caring about values, which is what I... I I think we see those crowds marching and, and the students chanting and, and what's so alarming to me uh, over and above the physical threat that they pose in those contexts is that they're really twisted in the kinds of things that matter to them. They are willing to whitewash evil, the kind of attacks Hamas has carried out. And they're, they're indifferent to what you described as uh, in the Ukraine comment, they're indifferent to the fate of Ukraine and they're indifferent to Putin's aggression. That is a mind that's really not oriented to human life and what ne what is needed in life, which is the creation of values. I think that understanding that fundamental nihilism and what is needed to offset that is a, is a, a pursuit and a, and a cherishing of what makes values possible. Yes, I agree. And let me reiterate, you said there's no short term fixes, or no quick fixes. There's short term action one can take, but action towards a long range vision, that's what it has to be. So we wrote an app ed praising the donors who are questioning the millions and millions they've given to the Ivy League schools, for instance, and really, this is what you're teaching. And this is the kind of student with this kind of outlook on the world. This is what's coming out of it. And I think it's right that they should be questioning this. They should be withdrawing their donations, but not for six months until the crisis is over and then we start donating again. It's rather you have to think, yeah, this was a result of a lot of perverse education over decades, and that needs to change. And the change isn't um, you can do it in six months. You can start now, So, and they should start now. So there's short-term action to take but towards a long range vision of reinstilling actual values in education and an orientation towards um, the best of Western civilization, which is the, a, a focus on reason and science, on freedom, on individualism, 
on the pursuit of happiness and American form of government. Like that's what kids need to learn, that that's what how we've risen to have the standard of living that they enjoy when they're on their smartphones and so on. That, the, where did that come from? What made that possible? That's what they need to understand. That's an educational vision, but it's not something given how bad the universities are now, it's not something you can change in six months or two years. Yeah, and I think the one way I would put the point slightly differently is that there's a need, there's a big hole in our society, the big gap, and what is needed to, is a vacuum rather. And what's needed to fill it is a positive vision. And what you're describing are the, the major features of that positive vision. I, I often think of the, one of the values of I get from reading Ayn Rand's novels and her philosophy in general is that it does provide a positive ideal of what human life for you as an individual looks like, what it means to live and produce and, and grow. And I think that is sorely missing in our society. I think that's one of the reasons the work that we do here at the Ayn Rand Institute is so important. It helps to introduce people to that exalted vision of what life can be and the foundations of what a, a, a value-oriented society is and how to, to get there. So I, I'm to me, that's a big part of, that is another aspect of what some of the short-term things are, is just to help people discover what this positive ideal is. It's, uh, one of my favorite lines you've said in the other context, Ankar, is the, the Enlightenment uh, needed a philosophy, it needed a moral foundation. And I think it's objectivism is the philosophy the Enlightenment deserved but didn't have. I think you put it something like that. And I often think of it that way because that's, what our society needs but doesn't have, and our job is to help people find it, is objectivism, the philosophy of Ayn Rand, and the ideal that she projects uh, in her novels. So thank you for being with us. Uh, we hope uh, to do more episodes in this special series, and we will be back with another regular episode of New Ideal next time. Thanks for being with us.